Sometime in July 2020, a geologist at a junior mineral exploration company needed to make some quick and important decisions. Let's call them Joe. Joe's company was interested in applying for a license to explore for mineral resources in an area near Tennant Creek in the Northern Territory. Resources like copper that are a critical part of a low carbon future. Data from Geoscience Australia had just been released and there was undoubtedly interest from competing companies, so time was critical. Joe needed to interpret the geochemical data and work with the geological models that she had in order to make a call that would commit the company to an exploration, a package of exploration work. And if your company is small and only has a few million dollars in capital and cash, that can be a big deal. Could she trust the data? Could she rely on the data in her decision making? If she needed to test the quality, did she have all the information she needed to do so? Good morning. I'm going to take you on an exploration of quality in the context of a, of a geochemistry laboratory. Why is it important to you? What does quality even mean? How do I measure it? What is the Geoscience Australia Laboratory doing about it now and in the future? I'll provide some examples along the way, and I hope this journey will be a useful insight and help you in your own work. I started with an example of a junior exploration company because many of you will be familiar with that scenario. But Joe could have just as easily been an agronomist working at a soil chemistry to help optimise pastoral or cropping production. She could have been a government regulator wanting reliable baseline information to help monitor potential environmental changes, or a community leader needing to understand more about their options for a new water supply. To lay the scene for the quality discussion, I'd like to quickly introduce you to the Geoscience Australia Laboratory. Geoscience Australia is Australia's preeminent public sector geoscience organisation. We apply science and technology to describe and understand the earth for the benefit of all Australians. That mission has enormous range from satellites in space to the cross mantle boundary. I lead the laboratory at Geoscience Australia and we have the fascinating and awesome task of analysing material samples from the, from the earth to understand geochemistry and physical properties. These measurements tell us something about how that rock or sediment or oil came to be and what has happened to it over geological time. The laboratory has four core capabilities, sample preparation and physical properties, microanalysis and mineral separation, organic and isotope geochemistry and quality management. And what I'll run through now is just a quick highlight of, of each of those areas. There are many capabilities I'm skipping over here in the interest of time, but more than happy to talk further if you want to get in touch after the presentation. So let's start at the beginning with sample preparation. As I will show you, sample preparation is the first step in the quality journey through the laboratory. We handle thousands of samples a year from all over Australia, but get it wrong here, and no matter how precise and amazing the analysis is, the results will be garbage. So we spend a lot of time at this point checking incoming samples against lists of field numbers, creating labels with new sample numbers, checking those labels, subsampling and checking everything again. This area also specialises in grain size analysis. In essence, taking a sample of loose sediment like this, say from the seafloor, and measuring how much the sample is mud, sand or gravel. And this is important because understanding the grain size of seafloor sediments can help us understand what sort of benthic ecology might it, might expect to find in an area that was sampled. That knowledge can be mapped to help produce a picture of the seafloor ecology, so this, this image from across northern Australia, which provides important information about how to manage a critical marine environment. To make these grain size measurements, we use both conventional sieving where the sediment is separated by different mesh sizes and modern tools that give dynamic imaging of the sample moving in water uh, to calculate grain size and shape. And while grain size analysis provides an important insight into modern marine ecology, life on Earth has left organic traces in the rock record for over a billion years. The organic and isotope geochemistry team analyse oil, gas and rock samples to understand that fascinating geological history. A recent example of their work is from the Carrara 1 stratigraphic drill hole, also in the Northern Territory. This was a deep stratigraphic well drilled into the newly discovered Carrara subbasin, which is concealed by younger sediments. Stratigraphic drill holes are exciting because they give us a chance to peek into rocks that we cannot 
cannot otherwise see and provides uh, a way to analyze them, find out what their history is. How do they relate to other nearby rocks and basins? In this case, the MacArthur Basin and the Mount Isa province that are known to be prospective for sediment hosted base metals and unconventional hydrocarbons. One of the first steps in understanding the organic geochemistry of this basin is to understand its carbon content and measure whether the rock has potentially produced hydrocarbons in the first place. In this case, measured with uh, a Rocky Vale instrument that produced uh, this recent uh, result. Um, this recent released total organic carbon uh, data from the Karara 1 uh, drill core samples. And you can see the depth. Uh, depth against the, the total organic carbon weight percent. So you can see there's definitely layers that have quite significant amounts of organic carbon. The next question the laboratory can answer is what type of hydrocarbons are these? How do they form? How do they evolve and migrate? To do this, the organic uh, laboratory can analyze for biomarkers, essentially chemical fossils left behind when organic matter decays. For instance, there are these hopane and stearane molecules. Using gas chromatography, we build up a picture, a picture of how hydrocarbons in a region formed and how they are related. For instance, this example from the Browse Basin offshore of Northwest Australia shows the relationships between various reservoirs and which ones were sourced for marine, uh, marine uh, organic material compared to um, deltaic or terrestrial organic material. And we can do similar traces using isotopic signatures of, of organic molecules too, looking at the ratios of carbon, nitrogen and hydrogen um, isotopes. And I find it quite amazing that you can look at a rock hundreds of millions of years old and it'll tell you what sort of plant or marine organism was there at the time. The Earth has a complex and dynamic history, four and a half billion years. Um, being able to determine the age of a rock is critical to understanding where it sits in that history and what relationship to the rocks around it and what has happened to it. These ages are a fundamental data set we acquire at Geoscience Australia um, through the work of the microanalysis and mineral separation uh, team. We target minerals like zircon, which contain trace amounts of uranium, which decays to lead over geological time. Separating these grains from a rock is an amazing and a vital craft to practice to world-class standards in the mineral separation laboratory. Pulverizing a rock to a powder is straightforward, but breaking it up just in the right point to extract these minerals and then carefully mount them for analysis is an art form. These grains are then analyzed with the shrimp or the sensitive high resolution iron microprobe. Uh, the name is a bit of a misnomer because as you can see, any, it's anything but shrimp-like and it weighs in at about 12 tonnes. But for all of that size, it analyzes small spots, about 20 microns or 20 thousandths of a millimetre. How small is that? Well, if we see this grain down in the bottom left there, uh, it can compare it to the sort of typical thickness of a human hair. And each one of those spots is what the, the shrimp is analysing. And this data could be, you know, as I said, it's a, it's a fundamental data set for understanding geological history. Uh, and it can also provide very interesting insights like this example from South Australia um, led to the discovery, you know, of, a, of, a, of an Archean rock in that part of South Australia, which completely changed their understanding of the geological history of that region. So those are only a brief snapshot of those core capabilities to give you some context for the sort of work the laboratory does to support the uh, ongoing science of Geoscience Australia. The fourth capability I would like to particularly focus on today is fundamental to those other capabilities, indeed fundamental to the laboratory and Geoscience Australia itself. I'd like to take you on a journey through quality and provide you some key concepts and ideas you can apply in your own work. There are many definitions of quality, but as I will show, um, as I will show, but I'd like to start by building on the talk from Geoscience Australia's chief scientist last year, where he spoke about the new ge uh, science strategy at Geoscience Australia. He framed the discussion about how vital trust is in these challenging times, uh, where science has never been more vital, yet more contested. To hone in on what trust means in that context, uh, I'd like to take you walk you through this example of this uh, impact pathway from the Exploring for the Future program um, 
Department for Geoscience Australia. It describes how the resources, ideas and talents we have are brought together to create uh, products, outputs that are used by government communities and industry and how those outputs are uh, then used in decision making to create outcomes that ultimately lead to significant impacts and benefits for the whole country. The critical step in this chain is between outputs and outcomes. This is the gap between our products and what people do with them. It's the step we don't necessarily have direct control of. We can't make someone use our data, for instance, but we have a strong influence on how they adapt and pick up that data. This is where people like Joe come in and where quality matters in building that trust. Joe is the person that transforms our outputs to outcomes. She makes decisions based on our products and on our data. Part of that decision making is whether or not she can trust the data and whether it is of sufficient quality for her purposes. Perhaps in my hypothetical example, she explicitly trusted the quality and simply downloaded the data into her tools and began working. Maybe she was a bit more cautious and she checked some of the data, she checked the metadata just to make sure it was going to meet the standards that she required in order to make those important decisions. So let's dive into this concept of quality some more and what it means in the context of the Geoscience Australia Laboratory. I'll frame this discussion by introducing three concepts around quality uncertainty, aspects of quality and fit for purpose quality. And I'll also uh, talk a bit about uh, a couple of uh, quality management tools that, that we use, but you know, uh, you can also use in your science as well around the theory of sampling and QAQC bundling. The first concept I'd like to talk about is quality uncertainty. This idea runs to the heart of the connection between quality and trust. The broader impact quality can have on trust in science was raised by Simone Vizier, the Professor of uh, Psychology, uh, Ethics and Wellbeing at the University of Melbourne. And her ideas build on the Nobel Economics Prize winning ideas of George Akerlof about how quality and uncertainty impacts a market. The concept is that the relationship between a buyer and a seller, or in our case, a data user and a data supplier is asymmetric. The seller or supplier has more information about the quality of the product than the buyer does. In George Akerlof's example, this was used cars. The potential buyer does not have information about the quality of the car. Has the car been looked after or has it been worked hard with some dodgy parts installed? This means the buyer is, uncertainty, is uncertain about the product and is potentially uncertain to buy and may even com come to distrust the whole market. While data we provide may be free to the user um, in that sort of more economic sense, the time and resources they invest in using that data isn't. They don't want to waste resources on working on low quality data. In the market, this hesitancy means the seller will inevitably have to sell at a lower cost in order to attract a buyer, potentially forcing higher quality sellers out of the market and lowering overall quality. Professor Vizier relates this to the issues with scientific publishing where quantity and aesthetic is overwhelming quality and potentially eroding trust in all of science. But it's not all doom. One of the solutions from the Akerlof model is to improve the transparency of quality information to reduce that asymmetry. An element of this quality uncertainty in broader science is the reproducibility crisis, which was highlighted by, by Monia Baker in Nature in 2017. Reproducibility is the key scientific concept where it should be possible for another researcher to replicate published method and results. The survey by Nature exposed that a majority of scientists believe there were significant issues uh, in that reproducibility. And these, these issues are coming for Earth science as well. A recent preprint released by Steventon et al. repeated a similar survey focused on geoscience making the point that sub of subsurface geoscience is particularly vulnerable to reproducibility issues, but is increasingly vital in resourcing the transition to a low carbon future. So getting it right is very important. And perhaps the, the, uh, the fear of, um, of that re reproducibility crisis in geoscience isn't as, as bad as, as in the broader survey, but it still indicates that the respondents believed a good half of the literature was not reproducible. 
and that that and a lot of that isn't to say well this is because the original work was wrong a big part of the resulting discussion is about what information needs to accompany results and data in order for others to test the validity of the results or reproduce reproduce those results and just as an aside you can also consider you know if if this uncertainty occurs within a discipline what barriers does it raise for multidisciplinary and integrated research which again are vital uh, for bringing our knowledge and our, our talents together uh, to create a, you know, a much more equitable future where those resources, um, for, for instance, can help that transition to a low carbon future. And this idea of quality and certainty has real life examples. This isn't just theoretical. At the risk of resurfacing bad memories for some, I point to the case of issues with a geochemistry laboratory at the United States Geological Survey in 2016. Although the issues were relatively contained to a small subset of, project, of projects and products, the uncertainty it created went much further. The issue came to the attention of the late US Senator John McCain, who then asked questions about the impact on, of, on other decisions that had been made based on other USGS data. Those data sets and decisions are unrelated to that particular laboratory, but the harm had been done to the, to the reputation. And a, and a key message here is important to remember that from an external perspective, organisations like Geoscience Australia aren't subdivided by division, branch or section. If one area of Geoscience Australia has a quality management issue, then it is the reputation of all that is impacted. So a key takeaway message number one is that quality uncertainty impacts us all. So we know what it looks like when quality goes wrong and the impact can, it can have, but what is it really? While researching this, I thought I would try a very 21st century approach and see what the crowd says. So I asked the geochemistry Twitterverse what they thought made geochemistry data high quality. I got 200, um, 102 votes, so I thought I was doing pretty well. As you can see, repeatable or reproducible was the majority, reflecting the focus seen in other surveys that I mentioned followed by precision, accessibility and relevance. The four answers were actually leading to two aspects of quality because I was interested to see what emphasis people placed in these. Reproducibility and precision are features of the product itself and were obviously highly regarded, whereas accessibility and relevance are service orientated and only about one in five people thought they were what made a data set high quality. I find that significant that significant emphasis fascinating. No doubt a function of geochemists being rightly obsessed with getting the science right and producing high quality data. Um, and, and I know there are systems out there for assessing data quality based on 612 or even 60 dimensions of data quality or features of the data set that make up quality. But from a laboratory perspective, quality is more than the produced data set. I really like this model of the aspects of quality from Kenyon and Sen. 2015, the two aspects I just discussed, product and service, are the external facing aspects that a customer or data user is going to see. <clears throat> what the, prod the product is and how it is delivered. Internal, internal um, aspects include supply. How is, the, how is the quality of the supply chains or outsourcing uh, contributing to the product managed? process. How is the quality of the process creating the product managed and documented? And organisation. How is the organisation itself committed to quality management? How is this demonstrated? And I'll explain what this looks like in later examples. I quite like this model for its simplicity in creating conceptual links between what we do internally within a laboratory and the product and service our customers and collaborators see. A key message here is that although as scientists we may focus on the quality of the product, it is actually dependent on many other aspects throughout the production cycle uh, in order to be able to make claim to that high quality label. For the third concept, I'd like to talk about uh, fit for purpose quality. Now, many of you would be familiar with this triangle. You can have any you have a product or a service and you have these three features. It can be good, cheap or fast, but you can only pick two. So you can have a good and cheap product, but it won't be fast. Conversely, you can have a cheap and fast product, but it won't be good. As a laboratory manager, I've frequently had conversations that are variations on this triangle because although we live, we, we all 
uh, when all is well in the world and we would uh, might consider that good is not optional, there is always pressure, always pressure to do things as cheaply and as quickly as possible, especially towards the end of the financial year when our systems create pressures to lean towards fast and cheap. Conversely, it can't all be good and and the perfect can be the enemy of the good too. I'd like to discuss a more nuanced model that helps that conversation about what, what fit for purpose quality looks like. There is another economic model called the prevention appraisal and failure, the PAF cost model, which describes what optimal quality looks like. In this model, we can see that at the level of the quality, items on the right have greater quality than those on the left against the cost of that item, or the cost to, to produce it. So it follows, follows that for higher levels of quality comes at a greater cost, like this. Matching this is the concept that the level of quality also comes with the cost of failure. The cost if the item is wrong or needs correction or remediation or the decisions based on the data are incorrect and also then need fixing. The idea that a high quality product is less likely to cause those failure risks, whereas a low quality product is more likely to trigger a failure cost. So the conventional model is to sum those two costs and look for an optimal point somewhere in the middle, uh, balancing the cost of quality against the cost of failure. However, for a government organisation with a longer term view, I would argue that this model isn't static. While we may choose an optimal position today, as methods improve and quality per cost increases, uh, the quality of previously acquired data is going to diminish over time. So over time, the risk and cost of failure is going to increase, for instance, uh, in this hypothetical model over 10 years. And presumably, there is a lower limit uh, for accepting this potential cost, at which, you know, which point we say, no, this data is no longer um, you know, doing the job that we want it to do. As a, and as a sort of a quick aside, quality improvement um, in a given method isn't just a concept, like this diagram here shows you. Uh, quality uh, Geoscience Australia has been operating various shrimp instruments since 1989, and we have a very detailed records of those analytical sessions. And thanks to Simon Badorkas and the geochronology team, uh, we were able to pull together this fascinating diagram that charts the calculated uncertainty on the reference materials measured during an analytical session. Basically, assuming the, the reference is homogeneous, how well has the instrument performed in repeated analysis of that reference material? So you can quickly see that the over, that overall this uncertainty has improved steadily since the 1990s from generally being typically well above 2% to the last 10 years of operating on our own shrimp instrument where the re, uh, repeatability is typically at 1% and below. And in some of that recent 1% has been arbitrary self, um, a self-imposed limitation. I can also argue that we're already seeing that lower limit of quality tolerance as the geochronology team has started reanalyzing older shrimp mounts uh, in order to review and reappraise earlier results. So I think it is important in this fit for purpose quality discussion to consider pushing the quality cost further. Because as the inevitable quality decay occurs, it means that the data has a longer shelf life if we're already starting at a higher point. And finally, coming back to the quality aspects, we can extend this conceptual model even further. Uh, the cost of quality isn't just in the cost of producing the data. It is, it's not just about buying a new instrument or more expensive analysis. You can, produce, you can push the quality level of your data higher by other investments in the quality management of your organization. You know, how you capture that metadata during the analytical process and how you deliver it. Uh, for instance, yeah, uh, you know, documenting your process, um, understanding the delivery and the, the service aspects of as well are all part of that quality equation. So the takeaway from this concept is that we need to be more nuanced about that, that magic management triangle. We need to consider what quality will look like in the future as well as now when determining the optimal balance between good and cheap fast. So we've considered these three concepts around quality, around quality uncertainty, aspects of quality and fit for purpose quality. Let's turn to a couple of tools you can use for your work.
around the theory of sampling and QAQC bundling. Again, this is just a quick overview, a couple to consider in applying for your own work, and the laboratory staff is very happy to talk to you about more. So I'm quite pleased with my little Twitter experiment and thinking that it's a great way to get a snapshot of what people are thinking. So next I ask the question about a critical aspect of quality in a laboratory, or indeed any geoscience. How well do you sample your samples? There is a big body of work on this called the theory of sampling. So my question simply was simply, how often do you apply this theory to your work? It turns out, not a lot. A grand total of two votes in this poll, and both of them had never heard of it. So takeaways message three and a half, social media is fickle. So for the next time you come across a social media poll, I'll run through the theory of sampling. I'll emphasize at the beginning, this isn't to say anyone is doing anything wrong. All scientists will have been trained on some of this and will know, know the potential for sampling issues. This is about giving you a broader tool set and nomenclature to consider when designing your sample protocols and communicating that more broadly. Sampling earth materials, be it rock, soil, sediment, water or hydrocarbons is actually really difficult. Like this bowl of nibble mix, earth materials are heterogeneous. They're made up of particles, particles that will behave differently when you handle them because of their shape and density, as we've all experienced with the small bits eventually drifting down to the bottom of the bowl as, as we take um, bits out. Those particles and elements are distributed. They may be in layers, they may be in clumps. This leads to two types of error. Random errors arise because getting a sample that is truly representative is, is, is uh, uh, truly representative of the whole is hard, and systematic errors arise because of the way we handle and work with those samples. The broader framework and the theory of sampling looks something like this, and, and outlines the various types of error that are possible in the sampling and an analytical process. This is based on the work of Pierre Guy and further developed by Francis Petard, particularly looking at sampling from various mining and milling processes where errors, analytical errors and sampling errors can potentially cost millions of dollars. Uh, and many of the sampling issues also apply in food science. This is where the, the summary diagram comes from. And many of these errors will be familiar to you if you might not just know what the technical name is, such as contamination and integrity errors. I'll show you one example of the type of sampling area we, we, we look for uh, in the laboratory and the laboratory staff spend a lot of time thinking about how to make sure we're doing this right. It's what's called the increment delimination error, uh, which is a fancy way of saying you've got to make sure your your, how your sampling is, is right. The increment being the proportion of the material you extract for analysis and, and delimitation being the shape of the tool that you use. You can see in this example that the things like particle size and density quickly come into play. As you manipulate a particular sample, those particles will move and tend to segregate by size, shape and density. As you can see from these illustrations, the shape of the tool that you use to take a, sub, say, a subsample, say a grain size analysis or for geochemistry, will impact the result. Uh, you might get a bias towards small particles, perhaps a bias towards large particles, or if you've got them, uh, the, the shape of the tool right, then perhaps hopefully no bias at all. So the, the takeaway here is that there, there are tools for considering potential sampling biases and proving the quality of your samples and results. Uh, and by the way, the Geoscience Australia Laboratory has the sampling theory book and it's currently sitting in my office. Uh, it's, a, it's a dense but very interesting read and I'll supply a bonus chocolate fish to the first person that requests a recall to have a look at that book. The next tool is about how we manage quality control and insurance um, or analysis. I'm talking about it as a tool here, but it's also a key quality management concept. We may outsource analysis as the Geoscience Australia Laboratory now does for whole rock geochemistry, but we can't outsource quality. In the quality aspects model, this is the supply aspect and it reflects a tough reality. If we purchase analytical data, then it is our data. Again, from a year end user perspective, if there is a problem with the data we obtain from outsourcing from, from an external lab, the end user won't criticize the external lab, they will criticize us. A recent paper by Egan and Al 
goes into details about these quality requirements of outsourced analysis from, a perspective, from the perspective of the Norwegian Geological Survey. This diagram from the paper is a great summary of the field and laboratory sampling processes that help monitor for quality variance at different stages of sampling. Whether it is how representative the sample is of the site, how the samples are handled in the field, uh, to the analytical process itself. Egan et al. Uh, discuss adding two project standards that I have added uh, um, running blanks to check for contamination um, in, in this example. Yes, the, the external laboratory will always have its own QAQC processes and reporting, but it always pays to us. Does it meet, meet our expectations? Are we pushing that optimal quality as, as far up the quality curve as we can for a reasonable cost? The next step is then randomizing the samples and even relabeling them to ensure that the tests are as blind as possible to the testing laboratory. There are other issues to watch for in working with external laboratories, and I would direct you to our quality team lead, Stuart Gilmore, for more information on how to set up a QAQC bundling for your work. The takeaway message here is that you can outsource analysis, but you can't outsource quality control. However, a, a corollary to the to accompany that a statement is, how do we do this sort of QAQC for high cost analysis where multiple duplicates seems prohibit prohibitively expensive? For instance, an isotopic analysis, or knowing the correct sequence of, of samples is actually key to the analysis, for example, in chemostratigraphy. Uh, I'm not um, touting that I have any, any detailed answers here, but I'm just flagging it as something that we need, to, need time to consider. Uh, in the past, you know, doing multiple geochemistry analysis was also considered sort of prohibitively expensive in order to do those repeat analysis as well. So what, what does the future look like um, for those more complex and, and currently more expensive analysis as well? And to end our journey through quality, here are two further thoughts, opportunities, if you will. A focus on quality is a focus on good science. In contentious times, science itself is still a torch that illuminates the world. And it's a key strength that it questions itself. And I particularly love this quote from the late great Terry Pratchett, that science is not about building a body of known facts. It is a method for asking awkward questions and subjecting them to a reality check, thus avoiding the human tendency to believe whatever makes us feel good. Quality control is part of that reality check poking and prodding our processes and documenting those tests and checks so someone else can then poke and prod is vital to the advancement of science. This is what builds trust, isn't it? critical to building that trust uh, with the people that will use our data. And a, and a benefit at the end of all of this is that driving the quality to a high level exposes the gaps where the data doesn't quite meet the theory or different data sets don't quite agree with each other the way we thought they, were, they should. Science philosopher Elisa Bokalik discusses this in her 2020 paper using examples from geochronology where increasing precision and quality of data over recent years has revealed interesting gaps that are telling us important things about how the Earth works. One example is radiocarbon dating, where as shown in this graph, the radiocarbon data of samples are different from their calendar age. The initial assumption several decades ago was, was that you know, the rate of radiocarbon production was constant, so you know, these two numbers should match. Since then, many careful and well-documented analysis have gone into making this calibration curve, uh, which as it turns out is, is also partially controlled by how, how carbon moves through the deep ocean. That gap revealed a high that, that gap revealed by high quality analysis is a treasure trove of information about ocean ocean circulation and its role in climate. What other amazing and important science could be waiting in the gaps as we sort of hone in on a, on high quality analysis? So returning to Joe, we've covered an overview of of the Geoscience Australia Laboratory, and I've taken you on a quick journey through quality, leaving you with some concepts and tools to consider in your own work. So what are the future directions for the Geoscience Australia Laboratory? How are we applying and developing those concepts? How are we helping Joe and people like her make decisions today and in the years ahead? 
The future directions of the Geoscience Australia Laboratory are influenced by several factors. There are the strategic goals of Geoscience Australia itself. The laboratory contributes to four of these impact areas. Any future direction must align with these goals. In the data domain, there are strong drivers to improve FAIR data, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And achieving these aims for geochemical data in particular starts in the, the Geoscience Australia Laboratory and is the key area of uh, research for us. There is a lot happening in the evolution of instrumentation, automation, miniaturization, software networking, automated workflows. A lot of advances are being driven by my biomedical laboratories, and this is only going to accelerate more because of the COVID pandemic. These developments will spread out into geochemistry and being in the front of this is an exciting challenge. Finally, the major strategic driver has to be user centric. What is it that people like Joe need? <clears throat> Whether they're in exploration, government, communities or our collaborators, how can the data the laboratory acquires benefit them? How do we solve their problems or help solve their problems? How do we make their job easier, better, faster? So to address these drivers, we developed a draft strategy for the Geosciences Australia Laboratory for the next several years. I'm pleased to preview, preview this draft today and invite your feedback. The strategy fulfills a request of the Geoscience Australia uh, portfolio or executive board and provides a basis for ongoing strategic and operational planning. It defines the role of the, the laboratory's four core capabilities supporting the goals of Geoscience Australia strategy 2028 through the analytical data, quality insurance and advice we provide. It also articulates how key components of Geoscience Australia, such as the science principles and science strategy are implemented in day-to-day -day operations. As you saw at the start of this presentation, uh, those four capabilities are organic and isotope geochemistry, microanalysis and mineral separation, sample preparation and physical properties, and quality assurance and control. You know, these are our four distinctive capabilities built on decades of continu uh, continuous improvement and essential components to deliver the great data that we do for amazing projects across Australia. The strategy outlines four directions for the laboratory across four objectives. Deliver and grow capabilities, increase collaboration and innovation, lead safety and quality management and invest in our people. We don't have time to go through every single one of these, so I'll focus on some key points to illustrate the future directions of the Geoscience Australia Laboratory. So we are working through finalising this, uh, this Geoscience Australia Laboratory strategy in the coming months and would welcome your feedback at any, any point about any of these uh, uh, matters and features that you'd like to discuss and what opportunities there may be for collaboration. I'd like to highlight four areas in the laboratory strategy for uh, discussion here around delivering world-class uh, capabilities, strengthening quality, supporting field work and outreach, and building a quality of a continuous improvement. The first strategy highlight is delivering world-class in-house capabilities. And a big step towards that is already underway with the refurbishment of the support building laboratory here at Geoscience Australia. Uh, the, the cleanup is finished and the construction will start soon. All is going well and we'll have this new laboratory in, labor uh, in April next year and the laboratory on level three, uh, the equipment there will move down to this new space shortly thereafter. As well as a new space, the refurbishment also provides a great opportunity to make some improvements. We can update networks which will allow more automated data flows, a key part of FAIR data principles. It's also a chance to revise our workflows and update standard operating procedures and risk assessments. Also key parts of improving quality and setting ourselves up for the future. The refurbishment work can be considered an expression of the organisation aspect of quality. Building quality in the organisation benefits quality overall. The second strategy highlight is strengthening quality control. This is also underway with ongoing implementation of a laboratory information management system providing the structures and tools to control and monitor workflows. This is the professional tool to enter preparation and analytical requests, check samples, capture results and document approvals and inform quality monitoring. 
The system is also key to a future strategic goal of getting some processes in the laboratory credited to ISO 17025. While there's a lot of work to make this happen over the coming years, it isn't overwhelmingly daunting. We already do many of the requirements for accreditation, but we need to take the next step to formally document those processes. In terms of quality aspects, this will be a further expression of the organisation commitment to quality and also means to, to more formally document our process underpinning our products. Again, providing uh, potentially providing that metadata that people like Joe need in order to make those decisions about how they trust, how they use our data. And referring back to the concept, we can't outsource quality. This also means considering proficiency in outsourced laboratories as well, and building common frameworks to raise quality everywhere across the analytical community. An exciting new strategy is the development of a mobile laboratory under the geoscience knowledge sharing project of the second phase of the Exploring for the Future program at Geoscience Australia. This activity aims to develop a mobile facility for two purposes. The first is to support the acquisition of field samples and data in some Exploring for the Future activities and beyond that program. This is a great way to explore the, the new tools that have been emerging in the last several years and take the lab to the samples in order to support rapid acquisition and real-time field campaign planning to optimise data collection. The second mode of operations is to support outreach in regional, rural and remote parts of Australia, where, where the Exploring for the Future and other Geoscience Australia activities may be working. We're currently collaborating with Questacon on developing science displays that can support this outreach work, be it at remote communities or even regional agricultural show, for example. Both of these examples are an expression of the service aspect of quality and in, in some ways help close the loop on, in, on those impact pathways I was talking about at the beginning by helping uh, by both helping acquire the data in the first place, but then also taking the data back to the people uh, that helped um, in the, um, helped us acquire it. The last strategy highlight re re relates to investing in our people and the culture we want to build in the future laboratory. The concepts of business improvement have many names, whether it's Lean, Six Sigma, Total Quality Management, and there's hundreds of versions of this particular diagram. But fundamental to all of these pro approaches are the principles that it's all about delivering the best we can, safely, on time, and as cost effective as possible. Focus on quality is the equivalent uh, of focus on the product. Again, going back to that earlier conversation where you know, geochemists tend to focus on the product, but the service behind the, the, the data is also very important as well. Both are needed to deliver the products acquired, uh, required by our stakeholders and end users. For a laboratory, this means deliberately and proactively taking the time to focus on quality matters as well as production matters. And there's also a culture of continuous improvement. We are always looking ways for ways to improve what is being delivered. The, GA, the Geoscience Australia Laboratory in its various forms has been doing this for decades. And this is what's already underway. With the awesome leadership of Jessica Bias, we are revisiting lean business methods like value stream mapping to understand each step of a process and where the opportunities are for improvement. And, the root, and using root cause analysis to deeply understand what is causing waste or delays. Taking the time to build this culture is critical to the other strategies of the future laboratory. It is critical to building a laboratory that can meet the increasing demands for quality, flexibility and accountability. So this draws our story about the present Geoscience Australia Laboratory, our focus on quality and future directions to a close. I hope this has been a useful insight for you about the capabilities in the future direction of the laboratory. We have some amazing range of core capabilities and exciting plans for development. We're keen to hear from you if there's opportunities for collaboration or if you want to talk more about quality management in general or, or some of the directions that we're going in. I hope that the key takeaway message from the journey through quality are useful to you and the laboratory team are happy to discuss these further and how to apply them to your work at any time. So let's go do some amazing things out there. And you know, key messages, today's quality is tomorrow's reputation.